Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm visiting my friend Ken in Lexington, Massachusetts and seeing his audio system. You've got a lot of stuff here and I thought we'd take the viewers through this to see how you do things. All right. All right, so let me ask you, when did you first get into audio? Oh, wow. Well, I guess it goes back a long time, Ed. It, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was interested in it. My dad had a stereo and of course I was playing with it endlessly, took it apart and put it back together. And then, uh, yeah, when I got into high school, I was doing computer programming, which at the time was something a kid could do and was quite lucrative. And so I used all the money that I earned to buy my first stereo. And what year was this approximately? So that was uh, 1981, 82. 81, 82. Okay. Yeah. So that's what we refer to as a vintage era today. So I had a similar story. My dad and I used to talk about audio equipment in the 1970s. And we would get into these dumb debates as to whether a Kenwood was better than a Pioneer. And, yeah. and we would read consumer reports and stereo review. So yes, I've sort of upgraded my equipment over the years, but you've kind of gone a little crazy here. <laughs> I like what you've done here, but uh, let's start with, I think the thing that is going to interest most people is the speakers, because this is not always what you would find in an American audio system. These are large JBL monitors. So where did you get these and why did you, why did yeah. you select them? Yeah, so actually these uh, monitors weren't sold in the United States. They were uh, principally sold outside. I bought them in Japan and um, geez, that was in 2000, 2001. In Japan, they got a following in the consumer market, which never really developed in the United States quite as much. And so JBL, these are JBL 4344 Mark IIs. Uh, so JBL in Japan has continued to sell these kinds of monitors there and, and in other countries, but in Japan in particular, they're quite popular. Okay, so this is almost the opposite aesthetic as what you often find in the United States, which is a small monitor on a stand put out into the room. This is a really big monitor, and that is an aesthetic in Japan. They like those. Yeah, yeah, you'd think in Japan with the small rooms that everybody would have tiny speakers, but it goes quite the opposite. And uh, yeah, I have a big collection of Japanese hi-fi magazines with pictures of uh, users' rooms, these tiny rooms with, with speakers that dominate. It's quite common. Yeah, and I didn't believe it either. I thought that these speakers couldn't possibly work because they violate all the principles that, that we've all learned about speaker design, that simpler is better, and you know you don't want to have too much sound diffraction and so on. The first time I heard these things, my jaw dropped, and I knew I had to have them. So that was, the, that was where that came from. So one interesting feature I found about these speakers is they actually need a battery pack in the back to power something. What is that all about? Yep, yep. So uh, they do. They have a, a nine volt battery that you have to plug in and that's for the crossover. There's uh, electrolytic capacitors inside the crossover and the idea is to apply a little bit of DC to them to uh, keep them biased and charged up all the time and then they will perform better in their function inside the, uh, inside the crossover. If you don't put the battery in, can you tell the difference? Yeah, you can tell, and you can even tell when the battery is getting a little worn. Okay. And uh, amazingly, even though it measures okay on a voltmeter, it's still, you can tell that it's very slightly down, and then when you replace the battery, it comes back. It's okay, better. Okay, good. Okay, so Ken, let's talk about your sources. You have analog sources and you have digital sources. So do you have an opinion on that as to one versus the other, or do you do, you do both? Yeah, so I go both ways. Okay. Uh, but for a long time, I was a big adherent of analog. I really didn't like the way the digital sounded too much. But, um, you know, it's come around, especially with streaming sources, these high res streaming sources. It's uh, frankly superior to the equivalent analogs that I have. So you, ha you have the classic analog turntable. Yep. This is a Linz on deck. Yep. Um, so yep. the thing about the Linz is they said that they created the perfect turntable. But from a marketing perspective, that doesn't really work because people buy it and they don't get any more money. So the Lin solution seems to be this endless upgrade thing with the power supply, the tone arm, and the plinth, and, and all this stuff. Have you done any upgrades to this? Or No, nope, I haven't done a thing. Okay. So uh, this is as it was originally, and I got it in 1982. Yeah. And in 82, it already had a reputation. So mm -hmm. it had been around for about 10 years, I think. And has the Valhalla... Okay. power supply inside and okay. that was a big upgrade yes. <laughs> from Nirvana <laughs> which was the previous version <laughs> so that people were all excited about that and uh, yeah actually I got a different tone arm so I upgraded okay. you the have, tone you arm have upgraded. I did yeah. but the, the basic 
turntable is as it was. And, and it's interesting because when I bought it, uh, the guy in the stereo store came out, the manager of the stereo store, and he says, oh, good turntable. He says, you'll never upgrade that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one thing you'll never, ever upgrade. You find a lot of people with that sentiment to own yeah. that product. Yeah. What cartridge do you have on there? So this is a shelter. <laughs> okay. That is not it's, a Link product. It, yep. So it's it's a shelter. Okay. And I don't recall the exact model. Is that heresy? The 502. I think it's the 502. Okay. Is that heresy to put a non Link oh. cartridge on it? <laughs> yeah. Don't tell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, it works well. Okay. So Ken, this is part of your LP collection. Where did you get all this stuff? <laughs> yeah. Most of it was a gift from a friend who was moving and he had to give up his collection. He couldn't take them with him. And where was this? So he was living in Boston. Okay. Yep. And yeah, roughly 4,000 records he had collected over the years. Everywhere he went for an academic conference, he would always look for a used record store and make a beeline for that place. As you can see, uh, roughly a third of them are in plastic wraps. Those are ones that have made it through the VPI record cleaner. An okay, essential accessory. That. Yes, that is an essential accessory. If you're a record collector, you need one of those. Okay, how did you get all this stuff back here? Well, it, it was uh, back breaking. Yeah, it was up and down the stairs, many, many trips. Okay, how did you get it out of the person's house? Uh, the same thing, plus a U-Haul. A U-Haul? Yeah. Okay. That will work. <laughs> yeah, you, it's amazing. So there were maybe 40 or 50 boxes of these, including maybe a dozen that said 2BD accessioned. Okay. Those I got rid of. Okay. But the rest are still a part of this collection. Now, I was looking at this earlier. You don't have these sorted. I mean, I see some Deutsche Grammophones up here. These yellow labels are up here, but most of this looks like it's unsorted. No, no, there's only one way to sort a collection like this, and that is by label and catalog number. Okay. And then you have a separate indexing system. I have them all on cards over here, okay. but you have a separate indexing system to find things. Just like a library, you have a card catalog. There's only one way to do it. That's You've by the gone with a, you, You're using a physical card catalog for yeah. all of this. You're not yeah. using an electronic one. Well, I've not bothered to hand type in all those okay. numbers. <laughs> it's just too much trouble. Okay. Yeah. So w would you keep the operas and the box sets in a different... Yeah. Well, yeah, you'd, that, that is true. So they're all by catalog, except for the boxes. And okay. those are separate. Okay. So this is interesting. You could get a Mahler Third Symphony, which is usually on two LPs, but sometimes you'll be a double wide one of these, yeah. but sometimes it'll be in a box. Yeah. So if you want another version, you may not realize you have it. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the problem with big collections like this is that frequently you have duplicates and triplicates and more and not even different variants. No, they're exactly the same thing because you know um, you end up buying the same thing twice. It okay. happens. There are many recordings which are unusual things from Russia. Um, you know, all sorts of obscure recordings which are not available for digital streaming, but the more mainstream things are. And then, of course, they're really high quality over the digital transcriptions, much better than what some of these old used records sound like. I found for a time back around the 1990s, it seemed like they were determined to release everything digitally yeah. it doesn't matter bootleg stuff everything just kind of came out so i have a feeling you might be able to, to digitize you know a, a lot of this stuff yeah well i did have an ambition to digitize this collection <laughs> yes. and work my way through it yeah. i made it through one of these boxes okay and i i called it a declared victory and stopped there it's, okay. it's a big job all right. So your digital source is a Sony SAD CD player. Mm -hmm. And we were discussing this earlier. I'm finding CD players from my time are starting to fail for yeah. a couple of reasons. The drawers yeah. don't open. There are belts, rubber belts that dry out. Mm -hmm. And the laser in particular, the output goes lower over time to the point where it won't read the table of contents and it won't do anything. So you had a minor problem with this one. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it, So I bought this in Japan uh, a little bit before I got the, the speakers. And it's, it's really a terrific player. Um, I think even today it's probably considered a top player. Uh, you know, they haven't changed too much in terms of what yeah. the, the CD specification is. And it was the first SACD player. And when Sony made it, they did everything they could to make a statement product yeah. that would perform perfectly for SACD because they were launching the format and they wanted it to do well. Anyway, yes, it did degrade. Yeah. So I got it in 2001 and then by 2011 or so it was having trouble reading discs. But fortunately, I was able to get it serviced here in the U.S. by Sony 
they were still servicing them, they had the parts, and whatever was wrong with it, they were able to fix it, and it's been perfect ever since. Okay. Uh, you have a Nakamichi tape deck. Yep. Uh, do you use that much? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. So I, I just, uh, I had many years ago, another Nakamichi wasn't nearly as nice as this one. This is, you know, one of their really nice ones. Okay, but and it's not the Dragon. No, no. No, this is well before the Dragon. Okay. So this was uh, when they were uh, still doing things in a, in a slightly older version. Okay. Yeah. Dragons still go for thousands of dollars yeah. these days. Yeah. Non-functioning, they'll go for yeah. thousands of dollars. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I was never smitten by the Dragon. I like the okay. older ones. Okay. Yep. So your preamp is a classic from about, I would say, 20 years ago. It's an Audible Illusions Modulus... This is the three modulus three A three A okay. Yes. Store told me it was good, and then I ordered it. I think on uh, Audio Asylum. Okay. And it was fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Your amplification here. You have a looks like looks like a tube amp and a crown. Is that a is that a solid state amplifier? It is a solid state. It, okay. Yes. So you have one of each. Yes. So. By far, I think the more interesting piece down here, and we'll show a photo of it, is yeah. this Siegfried. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, what made you choose this? This is, this, is a, this is something you don't just walk into a store and buy it. You buy that because you want it. Yeah. You, you, you actually go shopping for one well, of Well, that those. was a complicated purchase. So I knew about this particular manufacturer, David Burning Company, from many, many years ago and knew it was you know, a well-reputed name, but, but really kind of esoteric. He, he builds these things by hand at home. Um, in his spare time, or um, at least at that time he did. And when uh, I came across an article about another amplifier in his line called the ZH270 in glass audio. And okay, I remember yeah, glass audio. Yeah. All right, wow. So I read that article at least 100 times. I was so <laughs> impressed. So I, I ordered it from Japan on speculation that it would be good. I called up David Burning, and yeah, he was happy to ship it to me in Japan. And yeah, I, I got that one, the ZH270. And then I saw that he had an even fancier one that was a low power SET, only 10 watts, but for speakers like these, it would be perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. So I despite these speakers up. being quite large, they're actually quite power efficient. You don't that's need right. a lot of power to drive them. Well, that's the huge advantage. Yeah, they, they're 95 dB yeah. per watt. Okay. So it probably, when I listen, it's only putting out about a 10th of a watt to a watt. Okay, so this is a single ender triode design. Mm -hmm. 10 watts is actually a lot for an SET. Yeah, that's good. So good. just for the viewers out there, those tubes in there, those are not 811s. Those are 811s. They are 811s. Yes. Okay. Do, or do you have a... a from a, Russia. A, a, okay, I was going to yeah. ask, do you have a special I affinity have for... I have spares. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there an 811 you don't like that you, I'm, I'm never putting those in there? Oh, I got Svetlana's. Those okay. are the ones that, that they came with, and I got a couple spares just in case and nothing's ever gone wrong with them. They have thousands of hours on them and they're fine. Okay, um, so it's interesting that you do have a solid state amp. We, the Crown, I think, is about as different from, I, I think if you had a Levinson or a Krell or something, that yeah. would be as, about as far away as you could get from, from the Siegfried. Right. But, so well, what, so what, this is a bi-amp system. Okay, so I oh, have, it's a bi-amp system. Yeah, that's why. So the, the, the big transistor amp is driving the base unit in okay. the four-way speaker. And then I use the crossover in okay. here to split that out and then the upper registers are all driven by the the two preamp. Okay. Do you have to gain match the two amplifiers? Yes. Is that an issue? No. Okay. <laughs> you do, but it's not a problem because the crossover also has sound correction. Okay. So what I do is uh, all the L pads that are in the speaker are turned up to the max. Okay. So the speaker is as efficient as it can be. Okay. Uh, and that's important in the upper register because the Siegfried wants the easiest source we can give it. Right. And then the, the base driver is driven by the, I guess I have a 150, 200 watts coming out of that amp. It's okay. plenty. But yeah, I have it basically dialed in with these adjustments uh, to match them roughly. And then the sound correction takes care of everything else. Okay, so for the purist out there, you've got a lot of stuff here. You've got L pads, you're bi-amping with two different topologies, and you've got a crossover. Right, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> Well, you said you're digital or analog. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a believer in both. Okay. And uh, yeah, there's no pure analog source in this system anymore because even coming in through the turntable, it has to be converted into digital in order ah, to go through the, the crossover. At one time I had analog crossovers 
and compared to this digital treatment, they were terrible. Okay. So this is a big improvement, much, much lower noise and, and distortion. Okay. So I recommend that. Uh, yep, but the, uh, yeah, the interesting thing about this, these speakers are, are fantastic for what they do, but compared to modern designs, they're a little colored. Yeah. However, that's all straightened out by the sound, the digital correction software, okay. which works really well. Okay. So combining old and new works out well for me. Where is the phono stage? The phono stage is in the preamp. The preamp has a phono stage yes. built into it. Okay, it and, and you're happy with that? You don't yeah. really need to go it to works an outboard? Well. It's, it's a John Curl design. Oh, John yeah. Curl, okay, yes. Yeah. So it's gotta be good. <laughs> okay, um, so the thing about the speakers that I was gonna mention is, you mentioned that the Japanese live in these tiny little apartments, but they put yeah. these giant speakers in there. Yeah. And I think that's why they do it because they need to make a statement. I don't have a big house. I need something in here that's big that shows that I have something big. I think it's act that's actually a reverse reaction to that. That's why they do that. Yeah, I, I can't explain it, but yeah, it's just amazing. These enormous speakers, these look big, yeah. but they're nothing compared to some of the speakers. Yeah, I've, I've seen them, yeah. And the guy's almost like, his head is almost right in the woofer when he's <laughs> on yeah. the, sitting on his yeah. sofa. Uh, but the, the sound is the thing. Uh, there's. There, there's an openness and liveliness and fullness to them, which cannot be matched by uh, what I think some people call monkey coffin speakers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not interested in those anymore. Okay. So we should probably mention your wife is Japanese. Yes. That's why you're over there so much. Yeah. And she is a concert pianist. Yes. All right. Well, Ken, it's been great talking to you. And I think we're going to listen to some music now. Perfect. Um, so thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.